The tutor's impressive and hectic path underlines the moment of transformation of a Europe that was transitioning from the Middle Ages to the Modern Ages, in a world that was reshaping itself due to the major maritime voyages. Culturally speaking, it was also a highly fruitful period in which the Shakespearean theatre flourished, as well as Drake's navigations. That era is still fascinating to this day. The dynasty that Henry Tudor founded would last for over 100 years, fueling a golden age in music, arts, and literature. During the Tudor era, England experienced peace and prosperity. Shifting from an obscure Northern European kingdom into one of the world's most important political forces. Henry VII was born on the 28th of January, 1457, in Wales. His father, Edmund Tudor, Duke of Richmond, died three months before. His mother, Margaret Beaufort, was still deeply young. The widow was 14 when she gave birth to Henry, and labor almost killed her. Neither Margaret nor Henry were expected to live, but they both survived against every expectation. Three months after being born, Henry was given a stepfather, Henry Stafford, son of the man in charge of Margaret's guardianship. Mother and son lived at Pembroke Castle. The War of the Roses had started two years before the birth of Henry Tudor. It was the outcome of the ambitions of Richard, Duke of York, to the English throne. One of the victims of the quarrel was Henry's father. Edmund Tudor was fighting for the House of Lancaster in 1456 when he was captured by the Yorkists. Imprisoned, he contracted the plague and died. Henry Tudor was an indirect heir to the Lancaster House. During that period, the command of the Lancasters was in the hands of Henry VI. Henry Tudor was well behind in the line of secession. However, at the age of four, the tables turned. His grandfather Owen Tudor was executed in 1461. To avoid meeting the same fate, his uncle Jasper fled to France. With that, Sir William Herbert became young Henry's tutor. This period was the beginning of a long separation from his mother, who remained with her husband in England, while the youngster went to Wales to live with the Herbert family. There, he obtained permission to retain his title as Earl of Richmond, receiving a good education. In 1469, when Henry was 12, Sir William Herbert was defeated and executed by the Earl of Warwick. The following year, Henry VI returned to power. In the meantime, Jasper Tudor returned to England, becoming his nephew's guardian. At 13, Henry was introduced to the English royal court, where he began a new life as an earl, becoming one of the king's favorite relatives. His childhood years were now definitely behind him as he stepped into the world of politics and power of the English court. But that life did not last long. One year later, Henry VI was defeated by Edward IV. The former king died incarcerated, his only son heir was also killed. Therefore, Henry Tudor became the next in line of secession. Jasper did not lose any time and fled with his nephew to France, as Henry Tudor would be in great danger of life. Henry Tudor would remain in exile for the next 14 years. When Henry Tudor turned 26, he was probably already conformed to a lifetime of semi-imprisonment, but then everything changed in a couple of months. In the spring of 1483, Henry IV caught a cold. A few weeks later, he died at the age of 40. His older son, also called Edward, was only 12. For that reason, Edward's uncle, Richard of Gloucester, was proclaimed Lord Protector. Richard's role was to rule in Edward's name until he was old enough to assume power. But Richard imprisoned Edward and his younger brother in the Tower of London, after which they would never be seen again. 
With the prince's disappearance, Richard eventually assumed the English throne, with the title of Richard III. The prince's possible assassination is one of the most well-known episodes in English history. The reign of Richard III was one of the most controversial in English history. Also, he had to deal with the opposition of some of the kingdom's most powerful families. One of his major rivals was Elizabeth Woodville, Edward's widow and mother of the princes. Looking to attain revenge against Richard, she established an alliance with the Tudors, with Margaret Beaufort in particular. The plan was devised. Elizabeth and her allies would support Henry Tudor in his attempt to win the English crown, and Henry would marry Princess Elizabeth York, daughter of Edward IV, to Elizabeth Woodville. By merging the rival houses Lancaster and York, Henry would gain as much support as possible for an invasion. A marriage between the two royal houses would massively support his claim to the throne. The first attempt at invasion took place in October 1483 without success. At Christmas that year, the young pretender to the throne proclaimed himself King Henry VII of England, promising to marry Princess Elizabeth as soon as he had the crown. In 1485, Henry launched a new offensive, supported by the French King Charles VIII. When he stepped on English soil, the self-proclaimed king gained noble allies. Even with a smaller contingent of soldiers, he marched towards Leicester to fight the armies of Richard III. The estimations point that Richard III commanded around 8,000 men, while Henry had 5,000. The troops met on August the 22nd. After an intense battle, Richard III was surrounded and forced to retreat. He died soon after. Richard's body was symbolically humiliated, stripped naked, and pushed away from the battlefield on horseback. Henry went to London for his coronation as the first king of the Tudor dynasty. At 28, Henry VII had the challenge to keep the throne and pass it on to his heirs. The country had been in civil war for 30 years. The kingdom was engulfed in an extensive crisis, and the English people hoped that their new sovereign could perform a miracle. In the weeks following his victory, Henry had to deal with major issues. He imprisoned in the Tower of London Richard's 10-year-old nephew, Edward, Count of Warwick, the last male of the Plantagenet dynasty. He did not want to have to deal with any nuisance in the future. Some of Richard's noble allies swore allegiance to the new king, and others were exemplarily punished, including death or loss of possessions. This served as an example for possible traitors. On October 30th, 1485, Henry Tudor was crowned King of England at Westminster Abbey. It was Henry's first public appearance as King. He did everything in his power to impress his subjects, wearing the most dazzling costumes and jewels he managed to find. On January 18, 1486, he married Elizabeth of York, putting the end of a conflict that lasted 30 years. The White Rose of York and the Red Rose of Lancaster came together. A new and powerful symbol was born, the Tudor's red and white double rose. In September 1486, Elizabeth gave birth to the couple's first child, Arthur, connecting the Tudors to England's former hero. Apparently, God was smiling at the new king. Henry had secured his throne and had an heir who by his name established bonds with the British past, hoping for a glorious future under the Tudors. But relaxation did not come easy. In the following year, Henry VII encountered some episodes of rebellion, but he knew how to contain them before damage accumulated. He would only encounter another rebellion six years later. In almost all his reign, the king would encounter some uprising efforts. 
the monarchy was having growing pains, and often powerful nobles wanted to challenge the king's power. But he managed to be relentless with his enemies. Henry acquired the reputation of being a skinflint king. His priority was the crown's finances, remaining deeply attentive to tax collection. A common practice was to confiscate the land of noble enemies and lease it to get money for the crown. A core of loyal and efficient civil servants was responsible to conduct Henry's money-making machine. Like every good businessman, the king kept a watchful eye on his employees, attending meetings in person, ready to fire anyone who failed to meet his demanding standards. By the end of his reign, Henry had not just filled the royal coffers. He set up a fine-tuned royal machine that his descendants could use. As expected, the painstaking efficiency did not earn him the love of his people. Henry did not simply dedicate himself to accumulating wealth for the royal coffers. He also cunningly stimulated English trade. The king worked strenuously to reverse the decline in English trade, which occurred during the War of Roses. During that trouble period, the cautious English merchants developed the habit of using foreign vessels to transport their goods instead of investing in ships of their own. That was a blow to the shipping industry and trade security. The Shipping Act of 1485 to 1486 prohibited merchants from loading their goods on a foreign vessel if an English ship was available. Another law was passed in 1489, prohibiting foreign buyers from purchasing English wool before English merchants had acquired what they needed. Henry also signed beneficial trade agreements with Burgundy and Spain, but was less successful with the Baltic merchants. By the end of his reign, England was still a second-tier trading nation compared to Italy, Flanders, or Spain. But the king laid the foundations on which his successors could build. Curiously, before negotiating with the Spanish kings, Christopher Columbus presented to Henry VII his plans to reach the Indies. The king felt interested, but the royal council rejected to sponsor the navigator. They deemed the enterprise unnecessary. With that, Spain would become a global power with the exploitation of the American lands. Nevertheless, Henry sponsored John Cabot's expedition, who in 1497 arrived in the lands where today is Canada. Henry VIII did not inherit his father's interest in sea navigation. Elizabeth I was the one who continued her grandfather's passion. One of his major diplomatic moves was perhaps his alliance with Spain. In 1489, he signed a treaty and negotiated the marriage of his son Arthur to Catherine of Aragon, daughter of Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon, the Catholic kings. They would get married in 1501. Documents of the time reveal that Henry Tudor was an avid reader. He acquired many printed books and manuscripts, built a library in his palace in Richmond, and was a generous patron of poets. Musicians were also welcome in the royal residence. Henry encouraged his children to play and enjoy music. Besides being an expert in diplomacy, he was a skilled card, dice, and chess player, while also enjoying tennis and hunting. In his private affairs, the king appears to have been a happy head of the family, devoted to his wife and children with a healthy appetite for life. On April 2, 1502, Arthur died after contracting the deadly and mysterious wedding sickness. Henry and Elizabeth were shattered by the death of their firstborn. The royal couple was left with a single male heir who would become Henry VIII. Elizabeth of York died on February the 11th, 1503, after labor-related complications. After giving detailed orders for the funeral, the king retreated to a lonely place where no one could reach him. One of his daughters, Margaret, married King James IV of Scotland. One of the couple's sons would be Mary Stuart's father. After the king turned 50, 
his health started to decline. In the spring of 1509, he became ill and on April 21st died in his palace in Richmond, not far from London, at the age of 52. Few people mourn the old monarch's passing. Although he was one of England's most skillful sovereigns, Henry VII never won the hearts of his subjects. However, due to his father's efforts, young Henry VIII inherited a prosperous, peaceful, and well-run kingdom with more money in its coffers than any other European ruler. The Tudor dynasty had reached adulthood.